Hello, everybody. Honey badger here. Honey badger here. Honey badger here. Badger here. Badger here. 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 Okay, let's just get on with it. Cut to the present. Hi everyone. This is Benito's Explanations. The new, well, Sam's, Sam's Explanations, if you like. Or Sam's Fact. I don't know. You tell me. I don't really know. What am I doing here? I think, today, what Benito's left me to do, or left for you to learn, because he's incompetent like that, this is sens sensory ecology, and what what is sensory ecology? What is sensory ecology? Oh, God, another day on the streets. Oh, my life's gone so downhill. I mean, I do hate Sam, but is it really worth all this? What's that? You have got to be kidding me. What? What is hearing? It's when you hear things. It's perception. Great. And it also it also works in water. I didn't know that. Did you know that? I'm cleverer than I am. And it's got three. Plugis are cool. Do that, you swine! Oh, oh, you get out of the way! You little oh, piece of shit! Oh, God! Oh, dude, this was crazy swine! Get off! Get off! Taking over my show, you little piece of shit! Oh. Oh, hello, everyone! Okay then, sensory ecology, what the hell am I banging on about? Well, here's the definition. Sensory ecology is the study of how organisms acquire and respond to information in the context of their specific environments. Now, I say organisms, but in this series, we're mostly going to focus on the animals, okay? Because they're our favourites, aren't we? So, that's a perfect definition, really, because you, in order to understand how um, an animal processes information, and how it sees the world, if you like, and makes sense of everything, then you've got to know about the physics, the physical properties of the environment that it's in. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Now, if you look at any living creature, you could describe it as a, what we call a dissipative structure. That means it relies on a flow of energy. And that's basically what sensory ecology is all about. It's a flow of energy from the environment to the organism. But at the same time, it's not just a flow of energy, but it's also a flow of information as well, as shown in the definition there. So it's a flow of information, but also you could say it's a flow of matter, because we're made of matter, and that matter's carrying information. So you can describe it however you like. And for an animal to perceive what it wants to perceive, it has to be at exactly at the right place and at the right time. Okay, so that means every animal that lives on this planet has a particular sensory ecological niche if you like, and it's that that we're going to be exploring. Okay, very exciting stuff. I'm giving it the big build up now. So let's go straight in to our first sense, okay? And it's hearing, okay? One which is pretty fundamental to us. In fact, this is such a fundamental sense throughout the animal kingdom, it's going to take us four videos to get through it all. But anyway, oh, right, brilliant. Right, definition then. What is hearing, right? <laughs> I'm not going to offend you too much, but here's the definition. It's the perception of airborne vibrations, or sound, <laughs> okay? Now, that isn't strictly true, because loads of aquatic animals can hear as well. So, it's also valid in water, so it's 
the perception of airborne or waterborne vibrations. Either will suffice. Okay. So the whole mechanism of hearing relies on three main processes, basically. There's first, I've written them down here, first is the coupling of sound. So that's when um, the vibrations in the air or whatever medium it's in contact a receptor on the body. Yeah? There's got to be something there to receive that signal. Okay, that's step one. Step two, there's got to be a conversion of the sound into mechanical energy. So if we take the example of our own ears, then they have a tympanal membrane, don't they? That's the eardrum. And once sound hits the eardrum, as it's doing right now, unless you've got this video on mute, right? Some of you have. Um, it'll vibrate, right? It'll wobble about a little bit. So that's mechanical energy, the energy of movement going on there. Third step is that conversion, that mechanical energy. It's all very good if your tympanal membrane's moving, but it's no good if it doesn't get converted into useful nerve signals that can be sent through along neurons to the CNS, which means, you know, if someone scares me, for example, that means I can respond accordingly. Yeah? So we make sense of all this information. Okay? So, to start with, we're going to look into the sort of um, fundamental acoustics of sound first, and then we're going to be looking at how we study it in animals. A bit of a physics lesson now. Um, there are three physical dimensions to um, sound which organisms need to process. Okay? The first one is frequency, so that's pitch if you like, so you know, it's pretty obvious, this is a low pitch, this is a high pitch, right? That's frequency, that's something we need to detect. Amplitude, well that's the same as volume. We'll see how these relate to the actual um, wave, structure of the wave in a second. So, you know, this is a low amplitude, and this is a loud amplitude, yeah, very good. And third one, direction. You've got to know where the sound is coming from. Yeah, that's bleeding obvious, isn't it? So there are three things. So because of all these concepts, an organism must have a frequency range, that's um, a range of frequencies in which the animal can hear at. Okay, so it could be, I don't know, as an example, um, 20 to 100 hertz, something like that, okay? Um, there's also got to be a frequency resolution. How well you can tell the difference between two frequencies, right? Does 200 hertz sound the same as 201 hertz. Can you discriminate between the two? And we'll be looking at later at loads of tests we can do with animals to see whether this is in fact the case. Okay, so we've got that. There must be a temporal resolution as well. How well you can discriminate between two tones, okay? Let's say if two tones are played really close together, yeah, how far apart do they have to be in time for you to be able to discriminate and to say that there's two tones played rather than just one tone blurred into one, yeah? So there's that. There's the amplitude range, well that's the range of volumes which you can hear at, and then there's the amplitude resolution, which also speaks for itself. So there are the five components. Now, in nature it makes sense for an animal to have it as broad as possible, but I mean, it's a feature that we'll see throughout this series is the idea of trade-offs, okay? If you're not going to use um, a certain part of your hearing frequency range, if you like, then there's no point in having it, okay? What's the point in us being able to hear the ultrasonic um, frequencies made by a bat? Not really, unless you <laughs> study bats, I mean, I guess it would be much more useful, but there's no real adaptive value of that, so that's why we just don't hear the ultrasonic calls of um, bats. If you were a moth, for example, that would be evolutionary adaptive if you were to, able to hear the calls of bats, because that means they could, you could hear them before they could hear you and respond accordingly. And we're going to be speaking about that later in the series, <laughs> okay? Um, but yes, the tend is to have it as broad as possible. Um, the cetaceans, like the whales and the dolphins, actually have some of the broadest frequency ranges. And that's because sound travels a lot faster and better. It spreads better in water. 
So that's why they've got a broader range of frequencies there. Okay, so now here's a few facts and figures for you um, in terms of humans. So the, this is the current atmospheric pressure that's around us at the moment. That's around a thousand kilopascals. And that's all caused by this thing called Brownian motion, the random um, movement of molecules in the atmosphere. Yeah? Our atmosphere is made up mainly of nitrogen, a bit of oxygen, a bit of argon, and a bit of carbon dioxide thrown in there. Very, very small, mostly nitrogen. So these molecules are floating around, and occasionally they'll bump into each other, which means makes them wobble a little bit. Right? And that's what you call this Brownian motion. Um, the human threshold of hearing is about 1000 hertz, which to converted into pressure is about 20 micropascals. So we can detect very, very, very small deviations in this atmospheric pressure. As I'm speaking now, I'm changing the atmospheric pressure just a little bit. I'm making those molecules move just a little bit more. And we're going to be looking at exactly the mechanisms in which it does that in a second. Okay, so it can be between 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 3 times smaller than this number here. Yeah, so our ears are very, very good at detecting those little changes. Okay, and incidentally, 20 micropascals is the same as zero decibels. Now, the decibel scale is a logarithmic scale. Now, how the decibel scale came about wasn't really that scientific. What they did, they probably got a load of people in a room, played um, a specific frequency, gradually increased it, and told people to put their hands up or something when they couldn't hear the sound anymore. Okay, and presumably when everyone put their hand up, they said, right, that's zero decibels. That's the threshold of human hearing. <laughs> okay, it's not very scientific. What is most impressive, though, is detecting how much energy, looking at how much energy our ears can pick up. We can pick up four zeptajoules of energy. That's the minimal energy we can pick up. Now, zepta, you've probably never heard of that before. Zepta is an incredibly incredibly small unit, okay? If we think of milli, so millijoule will be 10 to the minus 3 joules, microjoule is 10 to the minus 6 joules, zeptajoule is 10 to the minus 21. <laughs> so incredibly, incredibly small. 4 zeptajoules is what we can detect. And if you put that into context, a single photon of light, a green photon of light, contains around 800 zeptajoules of energy, right? Just think about that. So that's the minimal light energy we can detect. The minimal sound energy we can detect is a very, very small fraction of that. So in a sense, our ears are better adapted at receiving small changes in energy than our eyes are. That may seem a bit surprising, might not it? Okay, so let's look at some fundamental acoustics and the physics of sound, okay? So, sound is basically composed of particle displacement and propagation of pressure waves. Now, that may seem a bit of gobbledygook, but let's have a look at it, shall we? Um, it all relies on refractions and compressions, okay? And forget this wave for the moment. Look down here. This is where we want to go. In fact, no, I've changed my mind. I'm going to give you a better demonstration. Come with me. Right, to demonstrate this, we have got five cans. One of chopped tomatoes, one of sweet corn soup, one of flour of courgette. This is a Mexican recipe, by the way, very delicious. Um, on contrast to that, we've got some baked beans and another flour of courgette. Okay, now we're going to pretend that these are gas molecules in the atmosphere. So for the purposes of this, whether it's baked beans or flour of courgette, it doesn't really matter. I've just told you that, just in case you were interested, okay? So these are gas molecules in the atmosphere. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna stimulate what would happen if sound came in. So say if I said something, for example, something really funny as I usually do, like a really funny joke, that's gonna cause a lot of vibrations in the atmosphere. I was like, everyone goes, ho, 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 ho. Yeah, very good, Benito, right? So imagine sound is coming in from this direction. That's gonna create a force on this gas molecule here, meaning it's gonna go forward, boom, and bump into this gas molecule. So now what's going to happen? Well, momentum is going to carry this 
um, gas molecule forward into that gas molecule, whilst also pulling this, the first gas molecule, backwards. Okay, in fact it's going to go further back than it was before until um, pressure eventually sucks it back in. Okay, exactly the same thing is going to happen here. So, boom, that's going to go shooting forward. That's going to go backwards, eventually come back to where it was before. Okay, same thing's going to happen here. Boom, that's going to go shooting forward here. That's going to go back. Okay, so this separation here, which is greater than the separation um, of the gas molecules from when they were in their stable state, that's called a rarefaction. Okay, that's what we were talking about earlier, rarefaction. Here, on the other hand, when two gas molecules are basically next to each other because they've collided, that's what we call a compression. So, as you can see here, what we've done, we've transmitted sound through these cans. The particles, the gas molecules themselves, haven't actually gone anywhere. All they've, this gas molecule's done has gone from there, back to there, and back to where it was before. Okay, none of the gas molecules have moved, but the sound wave, the sound, the pressure wave, has moved through these cans. Okay, and that's going to lead us onto a very important equation that we're going to discuss in a second. But for the moment, just know that the sound wave is comp composed of rarefactions and compressions. And we'll come to that very important equation in a minute. But now, taking in what I've said there, if you plot displacement against time, then you will get your propagation wave, your pressure wave, and that just so happens to be what we call a sinusoidal wave, which is just like the classic wave shape that you'll see anywhere. That's this one. Okay, so there's loads of um, properties of waves that we need to get a hang of. The wavelength is this distance from there to there, so it's the length of a complete cycle, often given the Greek letter lambda. Right? The frequency is the number of those complete cycles which, you, um, which pass in a given period of time, so per second. So that's why we say the frequency is the reciprocal of time. Okay? So here we've got displacement. So this represents the displacement of the particles as we go through time. So if we relate that back to um, my demo, if you remember the first can, for example, that moved towards another one, hit it, at which point its velocity was technically zero, right? Then it moved back, back to where it was at the start. So its displacement was zero again from the original position. But then it moved back even more. Then pressure sucked it back in again, so it's back to the original position. That was one complete wavelength, okay? From the point of compression to the point of refraction. Okay, and that continues all along this wave. There are various um, equations which I've put on the board here. They're not really that relevant, quite frankly. What you can also do is plot a velocity time graph. Now, how do you do that? Now, those of you with a mathematic bent will know that if you differentiate um, displacement, then you get velocity. Okay, it's all to do with calculus. Oh, God. Okay, so we've got a sine curve here. The differential of sine x is cos x. Hmm? Yeah, lovely. So, that's not really important, but the point to mention is, if you want to do velocity time graph, you'll get exactly this shape, but just translated, if you like, shifted 90 degrees. Okay, and this brings us on to this famous, very important equation. It's very simple. So, to work out sound pressure, this is the equation for it. It's Vp times Vs times R0. Vp is the particle velocity. Okay, so that's the movement of, let's say, the soup cans in my demo. Then Vs is the sound velocity. So that's how fast the actual wave is moving through the medium. So they're quite different things, really. And then R0 is the density of the medium. Okay, so... If it, we're doing this in water, for example, then R0 is going to be greater because water is denser than air. Okay? Now, you don't have to display sound in the, free, in the displacement and time domain like this. 
In fact, the more sort of angles you look at a particular sound, then the more we can learn about it. And when in the context of specific animals, we can learn more about the um, sensory ecology of a particular animal by looking at all the specific parts of the sound waves that it wants to receive. Okay? So often, often we um, use the frequency domain. We do the, something called the fast Fourier transformation, the FFT. Right? So here we'd have frequency on the x-axis and on the y-axis we'd have the amount of energy at each specific frequency. Okay? And that way, I mean for example many animals produce lots of harmonics. Okay? So that's multiples, if you like, of um, the same wave. Okay? It's probably, well, that's probably a rubbish definition, but criticise me what you like. So that way we, they'll separate out then on um, your frequency and energy spectrum. There's also loads of terms that we need to get to know with like white noise, okay? So that's, white noise is just all the possible different frequencies at exactly the same amplitude. So it just sounds something like and I, I don't know. Um, very rare in nature really, but it's important to get these, you know, acoustic terminology correct. And to model this white noise, what we can do is produce a Gaussian distribution of frequency. Right? What on earth am I talking about? Now, well, it's the probability um, to observe a particular amplitude, right? And it follows a Gaussian distribution curve, okay? Which is basically like a normal distribution, but not quite, okay? <laughs> but for reasons we won't go into, because quite frankly, I don't know. Okay, that's all very good then, but let's now look into some actual biology. How do we test the hearing capabilities of animals? Okay, and the most common technique is using this idea of psychophysics. Now, if you think back to the acquisition series I did, oh God, great fun, um, I talked a little bit about psychophysics. Um, so we already know more or less what it is. But here's an example of a great psychophysical psycho experiment done by Wittenbach et al. Um, on crickets, okay? And it relies on this thing called the habituation-dishabituation paradigm. Now, habituation is something we talked about a lot in acquisition of behaviour as well, so that should be no, um, shouldn't be unfamiliar to us. So, what these scientists were trying to do, they were trying to test categorical perception in the hearing of the crickets. They wanted to look at their frequency resolution, if you like. So just like the example of, examples I was talking about earlier, can crickets discriminate between, say, 20 kilohertz and 17 kilohertz? Okay, and if so, how do you test that? Well, you do it using this, the habituation dishabituation paradigm. Because what you do is you expose your crickets, you've got them in the lab, and you expose them to, let's say, a 20 kilohertz sound. And you play pulses of it, so it goes beep, and you look for their response. And in this case, they looked for leg movements, okay? Because if you play a cricket, a 20 kilohertz song, apparently they do something with their legs, right? So you do that, they go beep, whoa. Um, you can't even see my legs, can you? Um, and then again, beep, whoa. But then, if you play it again and again and again, they'll eventually become habituated, won't they? They realise that it's no threat whatsoever, so they'll stop rep responding to this repeating stimulus. And that's what I've represented on these graphs here. I mean, brilliant graphs, you've got to say. So, here, I've played the pulse once, and there's a big response. We've got response on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. Played it a second time, quite a big response, but not as big as the first. Third time, quite a small response this time. Fourth time, um, basically no response at all. Okay, so the cricket is habituated now. So then what you do is you introduce your test pulse. So now you're going to introduce 17 kilohertz to the cricket and see if it responds or not. Okay, and as you can see, no response by the cricket whatsoever if you put in 17 kilohertz. Then you do a probe um, sound 
a probe pulse of 20 kilohertz again. And as you can see, again, no response. This cricket is still habituated. So this suggests to us that the cricket takes in 70 kilohertz the same as it would 20 kilohertz. They hearing it as the same thing. The cricket can't distinguish between the two frequencies because if it did, it would produce a response here, okay, by the leg. Okay, let's do the experiment again, but between two frequencies that are much more separate. Okay, 20 and 17, well there's only 3 kilohertz in it. Let's see if they can distinguish between 5 and 20 kilohertz this time. 15 kilohertz of difference. So here, we do exactly the same thing as before. We play a cricket, 20 kilohertz, beep, boo, and then beep, boo, beep, boo, beep. Basically no response after four pulses. Okay, so then you're habituated. Then you introduce the 5 kilohertz pulse. So that's a bit um, lower, isn't it? So it's boo. But as you can see, still no response. Well, that's interesting. So, has, does it take 5 and 20 kilohertz as the same thing? Well, that's what's important. That's the importance of the probe pulse then. Because if you put the pul probe pulse in after that of 20 kilohertz again, then you go beep, boo, it responds again. Well, that's weird, isn't it? Because it didn't respond to the test pulse, but it responded to the probe pulse. So clearly, this cricket has become dishabituated. So this suggests to us that 5 kilohertz is treated in a different way by the nervous system than 20 kilohertz. Whereas 17 and 20 kilohertz are treated as more or less the same thing. So this is this idea of categorical perception. You see, it's thought that crickets can detect the ultrasonic frequency, so 20 kilohertz, for example, to detect predators, things such as bats, okay, that will want to sn snatch them off and eat them for their tea. Okay, so it's important for them to detect those frequencies. At lower frequencies, say at 5 kilohertz, they're the kind of frequencies that crickets will be calling at to attract conspecifics, you know, to have a bit of... I say this word a lot, but, you know, rumpy pumpy. So there's not much in it. If you hear 5 kilohertz, then, hang on, ooh, I must go towards that sound. That could be a potential mate. If it's 20 kilohertz, then shit, I'm buggering off. There's a bat after me. Okay, so that's what categorical perception is. And it's thought that between 13 to 16 kilohertz, there's a cutoff point. Okay, so as you go increase frequency, there's an increased number of responses in terms of anti-predator responses. But if you play 5 kilohertz, then there is a response, but it's a, it's a different kind of response, because the, the cricket is associating that frequency with a different sort of stimulus. Okay? So that's categorical perception for you. So this allows animals to make fast and accurate perceptual decisions, which it needs to do. There's no point just thinking about it if a predator's on the way, okay? It allows animals to make decisions quickly and efficiently. And it's likely that this sort of mechanism is occurring in a lot more animals than just crickets. So to conclude then, crickets basically have two categories of sound. The low frequencies for conspecifics and the high frequencies for predators. And they elicit completely different responses. That's all we've got time for today. We'll continue with sound next time. And of course, it goes without saying to subscribe. I mean, you've all done it already, but I mean, worth a go, wasn't it? So that gives me the motivation to make more videos, which is what you all want. Of course it is. But for the moment, see you next time. Get off! Get off! Get off! Get off! Get off! You little...